Once again, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is all over the news. It's a topic that's always framed the same way. A relentless cycle of violence where one side tries to maintain peace and the other won't let them have it. For many young people in America, the first time they heard about Palestine was on the morning of the 9-11 attacks. While the vast majority of Palestinians and Arab and Muslim people as a whole were expressing solidarity with the victims of 9-11, this was shown over and over again to a nation in shock. Pal apparently Palestinians took to the street chanting, God is great. People were throwing candy, distributing candy to passers-by. DC's leading ideologues leapt to conflate Palestine with terrorism, advocating the US military invade Palestine just one day after 9-11. Uh, are you suggesting that we've got to go to war or rather we should? We are well, at war. Go ahead, friend. We are at war. We have no option. I see. I, I would like to see military operations commencing immediately. When accurate facts about Palestine make it onto a national stage, it's short-lived. Like just weeks ago on October 15, when MSNBC showed this map that tells the true story of Israel's theft of Palestinian land. But the very next day, they corrected the story. Last Thursday, in an attempt to talk about the context for the current turmoil in the Middle East, we showed a series of maps of the changing geography in that region. We realized after we went off the air, the maps were not factually accurate, and we regret using them. Fletcher also issued an apology, saying the facts were dead wrong, and that there was no state called Palestine. When simply hiding and denying facts aren't possible, the U.S. and Israeli media go into a frenzy of spin to distort the picture of what's happening. Like in 2010, when IDF forces shot at and raided a civilian humanitarian mission to Gaza in international waters, murdering eight Turkish citizens and one American. They took to looping a propaganda video showing victims of the illegal attack as the ones who committed the crime. Mass media presents the story in a way that indoctrinates people with one distorted reality. Let's take a look at a small sample during the latest conflict. Where millions of liberals were getting their news during the 2014 war on Gaza, articles like this explained how the killing of hundreds of Palestinian children was the fault of Palestinians, not those firing on civilian targets. Another major liberal outlet wrote about a rocket attack that hurt nobody, ignoring the rockets from Israel that were killing countless civilians. The tragedy never ends, for Israelis, Vox declared. The attempt to shape opinion in favor of Israel extends to human rights organizations, too. While over a thousand innocent people were being obliterated in their homes and schools, Human Rights Watch made its main headline a condemnation of Gaza's military actions while Israel's flagrant targeting of civilian targets sent entire families to their graves was just a subhead. During the siege, when dozens of Palestinians gathered at a cafe for the World Cup, Israel bombed it, killing nine people and maiming 15 as they watched the game. The New York Times writes of this horrific attack on unsuspecting civilians. Missile at Beachside Gaza Cafe finds patrons poised for World Cup. It's hard to imagine more disingenuous coverage, but it gets worse. When an Israeli warship knowingly massacred four children playing soccer on the beach in front of onlooking journalists, it was a story too shocking to ignore. So the New York Times published another watered down headline. Four young boys killed playing on a Gaza beach. Then it seems a senior editor stepped in and demanded the headline be rewritten to something wildly disingenuous. Boys drawn to Gaza Beach and into center of Midi's strife. No indication of the fact that unarmed children were mowed down by Israeli bombs. Instead, Israel's version of the story was published, but it was justified in blowing these innocent children to pieces because anyone remotely near where Hamas might be is considered a legitimate target. Twisting the truth to create a strong pro-Israel narrative is standardized. But during this crisis, there was a disgusting level of ideological propaganda. One op-ed published and then retracted in the Times of Israel read when genocide is permissible, in which the actual genocide of Palestinians is explored as the only roadmap to peace. I spoke to Rania Kalik, investigative journalist for the Electronic Intifada. 
So, Rania, what do you think is missed most about the mainstream media's coverage of Israel-Palestine? Well, first and foremost is the daily, endless, 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week violence, that Israeli violence that Palestinians are subjected to. Um, you know, house demolitions, uh, routinely being suppressed, you know, protesting with rubber, you steel coated rubber bullets, um, skunk spray, uh, the ongoing siege of Gaza. Israelis just close off entire Palestinian villages in the West Bank whenever they feel like it. Settler terror, which is a daily reality for Palestinians. If actual lynch mobs in the streets of Jerusalem that are chanting death to Arabs and, and hunting for Palestinians to, to beat. I mean, this is what's been happening in recent weeks. And you don't see, I mean, this is completely ignored as though it's not happening, which is utterly shocking. I mean, you could imagine um, the response by our own by, by our own media in this country if there were mobs of Palestinians roaming the streets of Tel Aviv chanting death to Jews. So why is there so much pressure on the U.S. media establishment, Rania? Because, I mean, last year's siege during Gaza, I think it was the most apparent when we saw journalists getting demoted, relocated, or even fired for simply reporting the truth. There's also... Uh, the fact that a lot of the people who are covering Israel or in positions to be covering Israel um, happen to just be pro-Israel. Like in the, New York, the case of the New York Times, the Jerusalem bureau chief, Jody Redoran, is somebody that's, you know, she said openly in an interview before that she's coming from a, you know, a Jewish American Zionist perspective. Um, and she's really embedded herself in Israeli Jewish society um, where she lives in Jerusalem. She lives in an ethnically cleansed former Palestinian home. Um, every New York Times Jerusalem bureau chief does. First and foremost, I mean, every journalist knows that when you cover this issue, um, especially in the mainstream, um, you really do have to play this balancing act because you can lose your career over it. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think a lot of self-censorship too from so-called intrepid journalists who are working kind of on the fringe alt media sites as well. Let's talk about what Israel does to portray Gaza to defense contractors and other business entities because it's not really obfuscating the reality of Gaza to everyone. You know, it's deceiving a lot of the public, but it's really using Gaza as a commercial um, to other entities. How is it doing that? Last year, uh, three weeks after uh, Israel was finished bombing Gaza, um, it held its annual drone conference and um, many of the international buyers that, that came, what they saw was um, a lot of these weapons had been for the first time um, unveiled and used for the first time on people in Gaza. And that was a selling point. Israel's propaganda machine penetrates every sphere of influence, from mass media to social media. In fact, there's a term specifically for Israeli propaganda called Hasbara, which in Hebrew means explanation. 972 MAG describes Hasbara as a form of propaganda aimed at an international audience. It's meant to influence the conversation in a way that positively portrays Israeli political moves and policies, including actions undertaken by Israel in the past. Often, Hasbro efforts include a negative portrayal of the Arabs and especially of Palestinians. The more the Israeli military ramps up its aggression, the more it ramps up its Hasbro. During that same massacre in Gaza, thousands of sock puppets and Hasbro trolls emerged online to defend the mass killing of civilians and edit history in real time. One Israeli university has more than 400 volunteers working in a Hasbro war room to argue pro-Israel talking points online. Even school courses teach how to edit for Wikipedia offering prizes like hot air balloon rides for those who complete the most historical revisionism. I came here to learn more about how uh, we as Israelis and as Jews can defend Israel online, on the internet, and particularly in Wikipedia in this case. As a way of example, if someone searches the Gaza flotilla, we want to be there. We want to be the guys who influence what is written there, how it's written, and to ensure that it's balanced and uh, Zionist in nature. The information war extends even to dating websites, like this important information hub, Tinder. According to The Nation, several dating profiles that only displayed pro-Israel messages were created during the siege. Twitter Hasbro ranges from costly promoted tweets by Netanyahu to a never-ending stream of infographics, like this one, which implies that the hundreds of houses being bombed in Gaza were legitimate targets because they contained weapons stockpiles and command centers. Or this cartoon proving that Israel's moral superiority was the reason civilians in Gaza were dying from its bombs. Their propaganda ignores that even if cases exist where human shields are being used, it's still a war crime to attack them. 
Nonetheless, the term has become the crux of Hasbro, and it's used to absolve Israel every time it bombs a hospital, refugee center, home, or school. What Hamas wants to do is have a lot of civilian casualties, and they use this strategy of human shields for a reason, because they think it works. They think that Israel will be blamed for these civilian casualties. There have been consistent and very credible reports of the civilian population being used as shields by Hamas during the fighting on the ground specifically. We have video, and you have it in your possession, where Hamas is encouraging their civilian population to run toward targets that Israel uh, has distributed leaflets to stay away from. In 2014, Israel's economics minister said on CNN, Hamas is conducting massive self-genocide, taking women and children and placing them next to missile launchers. The fact that the kids were playing on the beach is irrelevant, said Bennett, because, quote, we find these launchers all over, at the beach, in hospitals, and homes. You have the living room, and the missile launching room. Israel has to make ridiculous cartoons showing resistance forces in Palestine using human shields because it has no actual evidence. Yet the term is repeated without question across the establishment press to justify its bombing of civilians. In the independent myth of Hamas human shields, it reads, some Gazans have admitted they were afraid of criticizing Hamas, but none have said they have been forced by the organization to stay in places of danger and become unwilling human shields. Amazingly, Israel is the one with a documented history of using human shields. I spoke to investigative journalist Dan Cohen, who's been on the ground in Gaza for the last seven months. In the city of Hosea, in uh, the central Gaza Strip, um, my colleagues and I found um, M72 uh, light anti-tank weapons, which is a rocket uh, you, you launch from your shoulder um, inside a girls' and women's school, um, partially funded by U.S. aid. Um, and this was actually, we found it in the principal's office, so which, which points to um, that Israeli soldiers were firing on Palestinians from a school. It seems to be a projection that the Israelis are making on Palestinians. Um, in, for instance, in Tel Aviv, there is Hakiria, um, which is the Israeli minis uh, Ministry of Defense's central command, and it's in the center of Tel Aviv, in a very densely populated area. So, by the Israeli military's logic, that is that makes Hakiria and the surrounding area a legitimate military target. Um, which is, of course, a violation of international, you know, law. Um, in the occupied West Bank, there are religious sites that are inside military bases. For instance, uh, next to Ida refugee camp, Rachel's tomb, which is a holy site significant to uh, multiple religions, is inside a military base where the military launches attacks on the city of Bethlehem and Ida refugee camp on a daily basis. Talk about what specifically happened in the village of Rafa. There were numerous instances of uh, Israeli forces using Palestinian civilians as human shields. In the city of Rafah, in the southern Gaza Strip, um, there uh, was on, uh, one day where Israeli soldiers came to a house, ordered everyone to evacuate, uh, and as the family came out single file line, the father, uh, Abdul Hadi um, Abu Said, um, spoke to, was asked by an Israeli soldier, do you speak Hebrew? When he answered yes, he was shot in the heart and left for dead. He miraculously survived. However, his son, 19-year-old uh, Mahmoud Abu Said, was taken by Israeli soldiers, kidnapped, they put M16s to his back, sick dogs on him and beat him, and then stripped him to his underwear, forced him to walk upstairs in a house that could be booby-trapped, and uh, proceeded to stand him at windows and lay their rifles on his shoulder and snipe his neighbors. And, uh, for, and, and then they kidnapped him and took him into Israel, interrogated him, and sent him back to Gaza. And when I interviewed him, he was deeply traumatized and could, could barely speak. And Dan, you yourself were actually used as a human shield by Israeli forces. What happened there? In the Ida refugee camp in the occupied West Bank, where I was living and reporting for a few months in uh, the, the spring of 2014, one day the youth in the camp um, drilled a hole in the apartheid wall. Um, and Israeli forces came in, 
um, fired tear gas throughout the camp and took and took and snipers took positions on rooftops and in the streets where they were shooting children in the legs. Um, and that day, as I was, I, I committed to covering uh, the the attacks as long as the soldiers were out there. And so, in the middle of the day. Um, I, along with two Palestinian photojournalists, were taken by an Israeli commander and forced to stand at gunpoint in front of Israeli soldiers as they shot children. Um, of course, I also, you know, faced these children are firing um, marbles from slingshots, which, while that doesn't compare to a gunshot, still could take out an eye or something. Um, after that, uh, I was eventually, I was released, and then hours later, um, as the soldiers were exiting the camp at night, they held me at gunpoint against a wall. Um, I raised my arms and said I'm a journalist, and they forced me to march, and as I was walking away, in the dark, I couldn't see, they threw a flashbang at me, um, which exploded right in front of my face, and uh, left me, I couldn't hear out of my ear for about a day. The term human shield is nothing more than a racist veil that makes the dehumanizing assertion that Palestinian culture encourages the death of its children. A more rational explanation is that there's nowhere to flee in one of the most densely populated places on earth, and that every single civilian location is considered fair game to be bombed. However, because of this propaganda tactic, the constant and indiscriminate bloodshed in Gaza isn't seen as criminal or deliberate by the majority of people. But this is a learned tactic. The term human shield has been the empire's favorite excuse to justify mass slaughter in its wars of conquest. In Libya, the year prior to the US NATO bombing campaign, the human shield talking point was used ad nauseum. In the lead up to the Iraq war, the Bush administration included the human shield talking point as a main tenant of his campaign to oust Saddam. Journalist Robbie Martin uncovered entire CIA reports dedicated to Saddam's devaluation of life through the use of human shields. Bush even preemptively tried to justify the enormous civilian death toll he knew was to come with the invasion by declaring the former Iraqi dictator plans to, quote, shield his military and blame coalition forces for civilian casualties that he has caused. I guess there were a million human shields in Iraq. After Saddam's capture, the human shields talking point was transferred to the independent insurgents fighting the U.S. military. In Afghanistan, Taliban militants are routinely accused of using civilians as human shields. Most recently, the U.S. military deliberately bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, using the debunked rationale that the Taliban was housed there, using the doctors and patients as human shields. Further back in history, during the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong was relentlessly accused of using defenseless civilians as human shields. During the Korean War, a U.S. tank commander claimed North Korean soldiers gathered hundreds of men, women, and children and made them walk in front of their tanks. At least 2.5 million civilians were killed by the U.S. military in this war. During World War II, Japan's army was accused of the same evil tactic. The farther back you go, the harder it is to verify the claim. But the propaganda has always served the same purpose to morally vindicate the oppressor's great crimes against humanity. But the Israeli government is doing much more than manipulating language and rewriting history. They're going straight to the source, attacking and killing journalists outright before their stories can be exposed. Palestinian journalists simply do not have rights. Um, as a foreign journalist, I have, I have a passport, I have rights, and Palestinians are simply not afforded that by the Israeli military or government. Um, we saw that last year when 17 Palestinian journalists were killed in Gaza by Israeli forces during the war. Um, it's a regular occurrence for Israeli forces to attack um, Palestinian journalists. There was one journalist who was recently shot in the genitalia, even though he's wearing a flak jacket that marks him as press. Um, there was another incident recently in which um, Af Palestinian journalists who were covering, who were filming um, an Israeli jeep run over a Palestinian protester were then maced in the face at close range. Um, and so whether a journalist or a medical worker or uh, any kind of civilian, 
is the Israeli military does not recognize Palestinians as um, professionals, journalists, medics, or really humans of any any sort. When I was in the Gaza Strip during uh, what Israel called Operation Protective Edge, on the final night, um, Israel decided to bomb uh, three landmark towers. And this was after the ceasefire had already been agreed to, it was pending, but just to send a message. Actually, an Israeli military general um, I saw speak at a military conference compared bombing these towers favorably to the Al-Qaeda attacks uh, on the Twin Towers, to 9-11. Um, but that night, as I'm watching towers fall around me, and I'm wondering if the tower I'm in is going to be hit, which mm -hmm. it had already been hit, but would be completely destroyed, um, I was frightened, and I was not going to go out in the streets for you know because I thought it was just too dangerous. And as the sun came up and the bombing stopped, about 20 Palestinian journalists came in from the streets, um, and these are people who are risking their lives to show what's going on in their in their city and their land and what the reality of occupation is. Um, and there is a media infrastructure in Gaza, and there are many Palestinian journalists who are risking their lives to show us what's happening, but they're simply ignored by Western media. The Fourth Geneva Convention explicitly states that targeting of journalists and civilians amount to a war crime. But that hasn't stopped Israel from bombing them on a regular basis. In 2012, two Palestinian journalists were targeted by an Israeli airstrike. The men were clearly marked press when they were working for Al-Aqsa TV, the media arm of Hamas. It was such a scandal that DC's press museum was even set to commemorate them in its annual list of fallen journalists, but caved to pressure from Israeli groups and removed their names. As IDF spokesperson Avidal Leibovich explained to the AP, the targets are people who have relevance to terror activity. You don't have to be reporting for a, quote, terrorist media outlet to be targeted. During Operation Pillar of Cloud, Israel intentionally bombed the Al-Sharok Tower, or the Journalist Tower in Gaza City, which housed international media agencies such as Al Arabiya, Al Quds TV, Sky News, France 24, and Russia Today, wounding eight journalists and blowing off the leg of a 20-year-old RT cameraman. The AFP headquarters was intentionally struck twice in two days, killing a three-year-old child. According to Israel, the building was being used for Hamas military operations. Leibovich said, We obviously knew there were journalists in the building. My advice to journalists visiting Gaza is to stay away from any Hamas position, site or post, for their own safety. What Israel is really saying is that it has the right to execute journalists anywhere in Gaza. According to Huffington Post's Sophia Jones, some foreign journalists say they have received a message from the authorities warning them that they could be used as human shields by Hamas. In breach of international law, journalists who must register with the government press office are also made to sign a waiver declaring that they are fully aware of the dangers to which they are exposed and will not file a lawsuit for any injury. Basically, if IDF forces arbitrarily execute you, it's because you are a human shield. And if you happen to survive, you have zero legal recourse. This cloak of impunity has prompted Israel to go to extreme lengths to censor the truth. According to the International Middle East Media Center, at least 17 journalists were killed during last year's 51-day Israeli assault on Gaza alone, making it the second most dangerous country for journalists next to war-ravaged Syria. The Committee to Protect Journalists says more media staff members were killed in Gaza during the 50-day conflict than in the rest of the world combined over that period. Israel's deliberate targeting of not just the truth, but the people telling it, should tell you all you need to know. The flooding of social media with graphic photos of Israel's war crimes is a new phenomenon, more dangerous to them than any rocket could ever be. Israel wouldn't go to such great lengths to distort public opinion unless it knew it had to lie to seem acceptable to the world. It's a sign of fear of its own mortality as a colonial state, only surviving on the US empire's lifeline of money and political cover to serve as its attack dog in the Middle East. While the Palestinian people fight for their freedom, we must fight the concerted effort here to silence their voices and expose the truth. <laughs>